Good morning, and welcome to the, the Museum of Flight here in Seattle for today's NASA Future Forum. Thank you all for coming, and thank you for those watching on NASA television, which is being aired on cable stations throughout the country. You can also watch today's Future Forum via the internet at www.nasa.gov slash NTV. For today's Future Forum, we're hoping to have a discussion with people here in the audience, but also with people across America through the use of social media and Twitter. If you have a Twitter account and you'd like to follow today's discussion, please join us at hashtag PoundNASAFuture. You can also tweet questions to our Twitter account at, at NASA underscore technology. Throughout the program, we'll be monitoring those, both the uh, hashtag and the Twitter account. We'll be taking your questions, and if we have time, depending on the participation here in the audience, we'll be able to take your questions and ask the panelists. Uh, today we have a great program lined up. We also have a wonderful group of people visiting here in, in Seattle. Uh, it's an honor to have here in the audience Bill Nye, the science guy. Uh, 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 Bill is a friend of ours and is the executive director of the Planetary Society. Uh, we also have coming today, uh, though I don't see him here yet, uh, Emile Decoux, who is a associate director of the National Symphony Orchestra, and more recently and more familiar to folks here in Seattle, the music director for the Pacific Northwest Ballet. Uh, it's a great honor to be here at the Museum Flight. Uh, the museum has a rich history with NASA. They've hosted a future forum here before, and we also have as our host uh, the museum's director, executive director, Doug King. Doug, you may know from the museum, and some of you may know him from when he was the executive director of the St. Louis Science Center, the fourth largest science center in the country. Before that, Doug also was the executive director of the Challenger Center in Washington, D.C. The museum has been wonderful in hosting us, and it's my honor to introduce Doug King. Thank you, David, and thank you, everyone, for being here. It is a beautiful day to talk about space. I hope that while you're here at the museum, you'll get to visit a little bit, and I'll point out briefly that you are welcome to walk around to the left into a wonderful space exhibit that already exists from the very beginnings through Apollo. Uh, beyond that is our great gallery with, anchored by the SR-71 Blackbird in the middle for those of you who love airplanes. If you walk straight out the front of the theater, you'll find the Red Barn, Boeing's first manufacturing facility where people made airplanes out of wood and cloth on beyond that, the personal courage wing, the great story of World War I and World War II and the people who fought them in the air. And across the bridge that you'll cross on the way to lunch, um, Air Park, where there are the first 737, 727, 747, and, and you can go aboard Air Force One and a Concorde if you'd like a little later this afternoon. And I should point out just beyond the tree line there, you'll see some construction, the future home of Aviation High School, which we'll be proud to welcome to the museum in 2013. <laughs> And this afternoon, when we go to lunch and the panel this afternoon and the student poster sessions, you'll be in our new space gallery. We are thrilled about that facility and what's coming as the center point. The full fuselage trainer from Building 9 at Johnson Space Center, used by all the astronauts to train. Uh, one of the artifacts that will help tell the story of the last 30 years of space. What have we accomplished? How have we learned to live and work there routinely? Um, why is, can we take for granted having a space station in orbit today? And what can we talk about what comes next? So in that gallery, we'll be telling both the past, present, and challenging young people about the future of space. That all starts today in this forum. You know, why is this important? Well, the, the real mission of this museum is to collect and preserve and document and interpret airplanes and spacecraft and artifacts and photographs and so on that will help future generations understand what it was really like to live through this first century of flight. And why is that important? I mean, things happen every day in our lives, but when we look back, and historians look back on this era, flight has changed the world in the last 100 years from literally an eye blink of history, a short flight on the hills of Kitty Hawk, to taking for granted that we can get on an airplane today. 
from 40 years ago taking a step off the planet for the first time to being able to at least talk about today, making it routine for all of us to go to space. In a historical eye blink, as I said, this, is, this happened in 100 years. Think about for the young people in the audience what the next 100 years can mean and our jobs to help them understand it so they can shape it. Someone said to me the other day, what will historians write about our era a thousand years from now? A thousand years from now, that's maybe a little hard to contemplate, but they're probably not gonna be engaged in the things that take up so much of our time today. Who will win the next primary? What are we gonna do about healthcare? Um, who's gonna win the Super Bowl? I was devastated yesterday that Albert Pujols left the St. Louis Cardinals, but you know, that's probably not a historical item. What they'll write about a thousand years from now is this is the era when humans first left the planet, first into the atmosphere and then beyond. We don't know the exact timetable, but we get to participate in it and we get to help create it. How often, how, how unusual a moment is it when you know that you're really experiencing history and that we're in the room today with the people that will make it happen? We're extremely grateful to NASA and our other partners for bringing those people here, for bringing all of you here. Mike Green and Derek Wang at NASA headquarters have been just great to work with and put this program together. They've set the stage for all of us to listen, to ask questions, to try to understand so that we can tell the story to others. You see, the, the other reason our museum exists is to inspire young people who will actually live that future. We have students here today from our NASA Washington Space Grant Consortium, from our Aviation High School, from uh, our Washington, NASA Washington Aerospace Scholars Program. You'll meet them throughout the day. They're volunteering and they'll be doing poster sessions this afternoon and wanting to meet all of you. They want to understand what the future holds for them. Why do those of you in the room think it's a valuable thing to invest your time, your energy, and your careers in the future of space? And they're typical of the 140,000 young people who participate in educational programs here at the museum this year and the literally millions in other mu museums around the country and at schools that are still as interested as any of us have ever been in what comes next. We've invited other museums and media and educational partners here to listen and to talk about how we can all tell the story better to the public. That group had a great meeting yesterday here. We thank all of them for coming and together, they'll help shape the exhibits and programs that literally reach millions. It all starts here today. So let's get on with it. It's a great day to talk about space. My job uh, is a really an honor. I get to introduce our keynote speaker. Lori Garver is the deputy director, excuse me, deputy administrator of NASA. She's appointed by President Barack Obama and confirmed by the Senate in 2009. As deputy administrator, Lori is second in command. She works closely with the administrator to provide overall leadership in planning, policy direction. Together, she represents NASA to the executive office of the president, to Congress, the heads of government agencies, international organizations, and external organizations and communities. She also oversees NASA's functional offices. It's her second stint with NASA. She had worked there from 1996 to 2001 and has been involved as a space advocate and advisor and partnered with lots of us over the years. Personally, I'd like to thank her for her incredible commitment to education that she's demonstrated in so many ways and for that continuation of that commitment at NASA. Education is one of the things that the agency, one of the many things the agency does very right. And she's a tremendous help to all of us in that arena. Ladies and gentlemen, Deputy Administrator of NASA, Lori Garver. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you very much, Doug. A wonderful introduction. Uh, the museum is so lucky to have you. This has been, of course, a partnership for a long time with the Museum of Flight and NASA, and we look forward uh, to having you help continue to tell our story, not just of our past, but of our very, very vibrant future, which is what we're here to talk about today, the Future Forum. So I want to thank the NASA team who helped pull this together when we talked about where to have our second 
Future Forum. Uh, this was the obvious place. And uh, the entire team, Dave Steets for our MC, Mike Green, Derek Wang, uh, our technology office is led by Joe Parrish, who you'll hear from uh, later, is all working so hard every day to bring you that amazing value of NASA. So uh, we appreciate the fact that as we enter this new era of space travel, um, that we're celebrating it in one of the world's finest air and space museums. So uh, one of the things about Seattle that is unique is it is home to one of our oldest partners, the uh, Boeing, who you'll also hear from later today, and one of our newest Blue Origins, who we hear from today as well. This shows the very robust uh, local work that you're doing here uh, to help not only uh, usher in the future, but help take us to new places beyond. So I see so many friends in this room. As we're pointed out, I have to give my own personal shout out to Bill Nye, who has helped explain the value of what we're doing at NASA for decades. I know that uh, my children have been inspired by him and when their teachers didn't feel like teaching that day and turned on the television and put you on, they, those are some of the days that they remember the most, so much so that my 19-year-old's band is named Bill Nye and the Science Guys, something that I, uh, uh, and Bill, if you would please tweet that, that would give me a lot of mom points because he wanted to make sure that uh, you knew and that it was okay. My husband's concerned uh, they might get sued. So. <laughs> It, it is true, and you will end up on their Facebook page. Uh, but we're all here, really, to learn from each other, just like we have uh, for all these years. How we can more effectively advance personal and commercial spaceflight, how we can more effectively transition the technologies that we develop at NASA to the private sector to create those high-paying jobs and open up endless possibilities for economic growth. Together, we're truly developing an industry that until recently had been largely science fiction. But now that it stands poised to open the, the, the new frontier, that next chapter in human space development. Uh, but first, a little background. As you know, we did retire the Space Shuttle Program early this year in July with the last landing of over a 30-year successful program. Many of you in this room helped work on that program, and we thank you. Contrary to what you've heard, uh, as Churchill might have put it, it is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end, but perhaps it's the end of the beginning. Our job is just beginning. The excitement and adventure is just beginning, and the opening of the space frontier is just beginning. The President and the Congress have supported a program which is now uh, making a renewed commitment to human spaceflight, and we're taking the necessary, if difficult, steps today to ensure America's preeminence for years to come. After all, what is NASA there for? Our vision is to reach for new heights and reveal the unknown so that what we learn from doing these things never been done before will benefit all humankind. So our plan includes NASA developing a deep space rocket that will take astronauts farther into space than we've ever gone before, coupled with the work already occurring on the multi-purpose crew vehicle. That will allow us to take that next leap into deep space exploration while at the same time continuing to create good paying jobs in the United States. The International Space Station will continue to be that center piece of our human space flight activities through at least 2020. The research and technology we're doing on the ISS providing breakthroughs to enable not only our future travel of our ast astronauts to destinations beyond low Earth orbit, as well as returning real benefits to those of us at home. We've established a nonprofit organization to manage our non-NASA research on the U.S. portion of the International Space Station so that we can really fully 
utilize this national laboratory. And as Doug King said in uh, his opening remarks, when we look back a thousand years at what we'll be doing to me, the International Space Station will serve as that time when for 12 years now, but hopefully indefinitely, has been the first time in our history that not every human is residing on one planet. We have had people living and working in space permanently for over 12 years now, and there will hopefully, and one of the things our program is committed to, and I am personally committed to, is making sure that does not happen again, that we become this exploring and expanding species. So our destinations beyond low Earth orbit remain the same and remain ambitious. We intend to uh, go beyond the moon for the first time to an asteroid, and the president has laid out, and then on to Mars. We're actually hiring new astronauts for these missions. We just, uh, on November 4th, uh, and inducted nine new astronauts into the astronaut corps, and they're the first post-shuttle astronaut class. So they're being trained to explore space. First of all, of course, to go to the space station for extended missions, and then go beyond. On November 15th, we open the next round of recruitment for the class of astronauts that would begin their initial training in 2013. These, in fact, may be those first astronauts who go to an asteroid for the first time and ultimately to Mars. So human spaceflight, alive and well at NASA. In addition, our science efforts continue unabated. Just two weeks ago on November 26th, from Cape Canaveral, we launched the most advanced mobile robotic laboratory ever built. It's headed to Mars on an eighth month month mission. Aptly named Curiosity, the rover the size of a Volkswagen Beetle will land on the surface of the red planet and next August begin seeking answers to those planetary puzzles about life on Mars. We're continuing to work on the next generation of observatories in space, the Webb Telescope. It will be the most powerful space telescope ever built and observe the most distant objects in the universe, providing images of the first galaxies ever formed and study planets that we now know exist around distant stars. Other sciences even now just underway include Juno to Jupiter, Grail to the Moon, Dawn's orbit of a giant asteroid, and Messenger's unprecedented data from Mercury is just beginning to be analyzed. So we'll continue to undertake these world-class science missions to observe our planet, to reach destinations throughout the solar system, and peer even deeper into the universe. Through our technology programs, hundreds of projects are being initiated, uh, and that space technology program serves as the catalyst for innovation throughout American aerospace industries and creating, again, those new high technology jobs. Innovations in fields such as materials research, manufacturing, and propulsion that will generate American leadership and guarantee that, later, that leadership continues in the new technology and economy. We'll also continue to advance aeronautics research in partnership with other agencies to create that safe, uh, more environmentally friendly, and efficient travel network for the next generation air transportation system. So these efforts provide new knowledge. That's what we're there for at NASA, remember. New challenges and increased inspiration to that next generation of leaders. Finally, we're very, very committed to having American companies in partnership with NASA send our cargo and precious astronauts to and from the International Space Station rather than continuing to outsource this work to foreign governments. In order to make good on the whole plan, we need this part of the plan to work. This is critical, and it is only through this investment and our technology investment that our missions and programs will be able to be conducted in a way that allows for the, the valuable dollars that are uh, invested by the public and NASA to return uh, more science and uh, effectively expand our envelope outward. So with growing launch costs, we have been able to spend less and less on the science missions, sending fewer and fewer people in space. We need to change that paradigm, lowering those launch costs so we can do more. We can do the hard thing. So let's be clear about our agenda. 
It's probably pretty familiar to those of you here in Seattle and elsewhere. It has been used over and over. That agenda is investing in the nation's, uh, investing the nation's valuable tax dollars to assure a healthier, more competitive industrial base that advances technology, provides more scientific benefit, and expands humanity's presence farther than ever before while creating new markets, new industries, and new jobs to advance our national security and our economic future. This is our agenda. We're committed to it, we're proud of it, and we're thrilled that so many of you are partners with us on it. Here in the United States alone, according to a recent FAA report, commercial space transportation and enabled industries generated $208 billion in economic activity, employed more than one million people, that was in 2009, with earnings exceeding $53 billion. That economic impact is only expected to grow, and again, that growth is our agenda. As you know, the partnership between government and industry that we're talking about in space is not new. I recently read an article from 1961 where the chairman of General Electric Company, Ralph Cordner, encouraged the shifting of space activities from exclusively government hands to partnership with the private sector. Hey, NASA had been around for three years. It's time to turn this over, right? 1961. In comparing the then Soviet model to the United States, he said, the United States has its own more effective way of concentrating efficient effort on a technical project of importance to the national security, and that is for the people through government to determine the objectives to be maintained, that's our role, and then turn over to the private firms that have the managerial and technical capability to get the work done. Using competition and profit or loss incentives to the maximum. He added, when the national need is clear, the partnership of government and industry in the United States can work technical miracles. We know that's what we've been doing in partnership in the past, and we can work miracles together in the future. He also warned of the dangers of too much government control. He said that perhaps the government's portion should be around 5% of what we do, of the technical work and space program that would best be done in government laboratories. As we step up our activities, he said, on the space frontier, many companies, universities, and individual citizens will become increasingly dependent on the political whims, found familiar, and necessities of the federal government. But it's the competitive system, with its profit and loss disciplines, that puts men, this was 1961, and companies to the test, as no other system does. It rewards the creative and the efficient. It provides a natural and effective system for elimination of failure, complacency, and delay. At its best, the competitive economy has a vigor, diversity, creativity, and efficiency that no controlled economy can match. Government should do for the citizens at their expense, those are the NASA dollars, only those things that citizens cannot do for themselves through their private institutions. 1961. So NASA's not-so-new plan will allow each of us to do just that, to perform our appropriate roles, the commercial sector to play a larger role in Earth orbit logistics and operations so that government can continue and concentrate on researching and developing deep space capabilities necessary to take humans beyond low Earth orbit to places we've never been before. The International Space Station is well positioned to help promote this growth of the low Earth orbit space economy by operating as a customer and a first destination for our US companies capable of transporting crew and cargo in orbit. While many of us maybe are a little frustrated that uh, we haven't been able to advance this agenda faster, I really want to emphasize the strides that we have, in fact, made together. Strides that would not be possible without all of you and uh, many of you who will be speaking later today. You know that we have implemented the two-phased approach for cargo to the International Space Station, first with COTS to develop and demonstrate commercial cargo transportation systems, and then commercial resupply services following up CRS to procure those cargo resupply services. 
Our partners in COTS, SpaceX, and Orbital Sciences are making significant progress in developing and demonstrating their systems. Uh, NASA has invested significant um, uh, money, $800 million about in these efforts. So we are very, very pleased to announce just today that NASA is announcing that they, we have set the target date to continue to make our progress. Uh, our target date for uh, launch on February 7th next year for SpaceX's second commercial orbital transportation services demonstration. So pending all the final safety reviews and testing, SpaceX will send its Dragon spacecraft to rendezvous with the International Space Station uh, in less than two months. So it is the opening of that new commercial uh, cargo delivery era for ISS. And it's uh, great news for NASA and SpaceX together. Uh, and, um, we have our uh, Gwen Schott, while speaking later, can talk in more detail uh, about this announcement today. So we're also providing commercial resupply services uh, after these milestones are met. And we have committed $3.5 billion about for these efforts, uh, again, if they are successful. So, in the area of crew transportation, we have the CC Dev program, which you'll also be hearing more about uh, next from our uh, leader of our commercial crew programs, Phil McAllister. NASA has conducted two rounds of competition so far, and we are soliciting proposals from U.S. industry participation for those next uh, phases of this program. The first round of SpaceX agreements went to Blue Origin, Boeing, Paragon Space Development Corp, Sierra Nevada, and United Launch Alliance. And uh, our second round of competition uh, winners were Blue Origin, Boeing, Sierra Nevada, and SpaceX. That second round, NASA has invested around $338 million. For our 2012 budget for this program, while we have uh, just received our appropriation from Congress for uh, $406 million, and that is significantly less than our requested $850 million, it is nevertheless a significant step, and we are looking now at uh, an evaluation of how we move forward most effectively to advance the time when we will be able to count on U.S. companies to deliver our precious uh, astronauts to and from the space station. So we do anticipate that one or more commercial crew systems will be available for the transportation of astronauts to the space station, as well as the provision of rescue services uh, by the middle of this decade. And success of this program will, of course, end the outsourcing of the service to foreign providers. So while it's not a new idea, it should not be surprising that this increased emphasis and really, for the first time, significant investment on behalf of NASA has reached the stage where a real threat exists to the status quo. Uh, so it is natural that that success inspires sometimes a negative reaction by vested interests. And of course, history is rich with examples of industries and entities in transition, where those whose livelihoods and in some cases, very lives, were threatened by a new paradigm. Uh, and they often choose sometimes to fight instead of to adapt. And uh, history proves that adaptation is critical to success, and in some cases, survival. Think of the dinosaurs and what happened to them. They were not able to adapt. But a local, more recent example is obviously the personal computer industry. While Bill Gates and the recently late Steve Jobs are revered today by nearly all, it wasn't very long ago that the established computer companies fought these individuals and their inevitable advances. But IBM and others are even more successful and healthy today than they were before these new companies uh, existed. Why? Because they were able to adapt. So this is the model that we hope for our established aerospace industry. We want a healthy, growing, robust, an internationally competitive aerospace industry. And while we may be maybe in the 70s, the disco era, as a comparison to the computer industry, we are so pleased to see so many early adapters, and we welcome them. A more current example of this scenario is uh, from the entertainment world. If you've seen the recent movie Moneyball, uh, in a conversation near the end of the movie with John Henry, who is the owner of the Boston Red Sox, and Billy Bean, the general manager 
of the Oakland A's in 2002, uh, John Henry talks to Billy about why it should not be a surprise that he uh, has not been very popular with his new ideas. So Billy had almost won the championship that year in 2002 with one of the lowest payrolls in baseball through a new statistical strategy that predicted and produced more victories with use of undervalued ball players who had a knack for getting on base than the existing expensive time-consuming and inefficient method of traditional scouting. So it was a revolutionary way of putting together a winning baseball team called Sabermetrics. So, as one might expect, the approach was not so well received by baseball traditionalists, scouts, pundits, players, and journalists. So it might sound familiar. Uh, John Henry, who was an early adapter and had just gone to the, the Boston Red Sox, saw what Billy Bean had done and was trying to woo him to bring that system to Boston. So during their meeting, Henry explains to Bean that he should understand why baseball old timers and standard bearers were fighting this new system. He says to Bean that a trailblazer, the first man through the gap, always gets bloodied, whether it's in business or politics. He reminded Bean that people who are used to doing things the old way will fight like hell to preserve their careers and the status quo. In the movie, he says, Billy, people go batshit crazy when you try to change. <laughs> That's what we're up against as we work to advance space development and change. And we need to keep in mind where uh, this story uh, will go. Because dinosaurs don't roam the Earth, the computing power of a 1970s mainframe exists in your iPhone, and every single baseball team in America uses some form of saber metrics to recruit baseball players. It should be noted that those who adopted this trend first, all these trends first, mammals uh, on up, gained the greatest competitive advantage. Uh, so what we are trying to do is have our whole community gain that competitive advantage, moving out faster on this ambitious new direction that our nation's leaders have given us. Developing new technologies, developing partnerships, providing opportunities for competition and innovation, and looking for ways to get the most mileage out of all of the hard work over the decades that this community has invested in the fields of engineering, science, aeronautics, and technology. This is what will inspire the next generation. This is what you can talk about in the Museum of Flight. Thank you for being part of it, each and every one of you. Uh, we look forward to strengthening our partnerships with all of you as we take the next big leap in space exploration. So thank you very much. I'll turn it back to David, but I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you and welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Lori. That was a great, great discussion about the past, present, and future fitting to be taking place here at the Museum of Flight. Uh, we now can take some questions from the audience, if there are questions from folks here who would like to ask questions of the Deputy Administrator. Uh, just a reminder that you can also follow today's conversation on Twitter, at Pound NASA Future. We have microphones here in the back of the room, if anyone would like to step up and ask a question of Ms. Garber, apologies to have to have folks take a, a little bit of a hike. We're going to move them on down. Also, for anyone who's coming in late who would like to come up and take a seat, please feel free to do so. Good morning. Tom Nugent, Laser Motive. Um, I understand uh, your, your point about uh, switching to the private model, especially in, in cargo services, and I'm, I'm in full agreement. And I wonder, how do you look at balancing what some people might view as those short-term important steps with requirements for some of the longer-term fundamental technology investments that need to happen to ensure future developments in space development? You know, uh, it is, we hope, a, a portfolio of investment on NASA, we have to invest something in those longer-term technologies that will benefit in 
uh, the decades uh, to come, but we also need to help make that transition to the private sector. So investing in things that uh, there are future markets for, that industry might actually have the ability to have the government not be its sole customer. So we have been transferring cargo and crew to low Earth orbit for 50 years, and we've been doing that with our industrial partnerships. There are more things and more people who want to go to space than just on behalf of the government. So we feel this is a very uh, natural, ripe area for that transitional time. While we continue to invest in those technologies that we don't know which ones will develop into new markets. That's how the government works. NASA shouldn't be operating these systems we should be doing the research. We should be making the new discoveries. And if we can do that with our partners and they can uh, help provide new markets and open uh, these uh, e economic growth for those types of uh, things that, that are not just government, that will benefit it, us all. That is capitalism. And uh, we don't believe that the very best of us is just in government. We believe that uh, this whole system has a lot to offer space exploration, as it has aeronautics, earth sciences, communications, those many, many things we have invested in at NASA that are providing benefit uh, by our uh, commercial partners. Thank you. Hi there. Um, I have a question concerning the continued, uh, by, through, through the Obama administration, through a, a continued systemic takedown of NASA um, that, you know, put forward as a, as a fraud that we would end the manned space program and then move towards the instrumental, uh, or keep the instrumental aspects going of NASA, which of course has not happened. We're gutting the instrumental side too. Uh, so my question is this. Uh, Dmitry Rogozin, who is the NATO, uh, uh, the Russian envoy to NATO, uh, proposed a strategic defense of the Earth, which is a revival of Lyndon LaRouche's uh, strategic defense initiative, which would not only render nuclear warfare obsolete, but deal with threats we face from space, such as asteroids, et cetera. Uh, and they had put this forward after the Obama administration refused to give the Russians assurances that the missile defense systems in Eastern Europe were not aimed at Russia. Uh, they did, so they proposed the SDE as a war avoidance policy uh, to avoid a thermonuclear showdown, which is now shaping up. So uh, my question is this, which is, will there be a future for NASA and frankly for our country with Obama uh, in the presidency? And as well, would you support the strategic defense of the Earth policy put forward by the Russians? I don't feel I can at, at NASA as a civil space agency address the missile defense issues, but it's not completely unrelated to my answer to the first, which is the Obama administration has done nothing other than advancing our human uh, space program and advancing our investment in NASA. We have asked for uh, increased budgets each year. It has actually been the Congress who has, has made our cuts. Most recently in 2012, we asked for $18.7 billion for NASA. It was the Congress who gave us about a billion dollars less than that. The Bush administration had actually determined and decided to end the space shuttle program more than six years ago. The Obama administration, when we came in, quickly added two more flights. It was all the flights that could be added because that's the number of external tanks we had. We wanted to fully utilize the International Space Station, so we added the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, a wonderful science experiment for Space Station, which had been canceled by the Bush administration. And we added that very last flight of discoveries so that we could add all of the capability of space station that it would take to be able to have this permanent presence until we can get there again from U.S. soil. So we not only extended the shuttle program, but accelerated the program to get astronauts to and from space from here in U.S. soil. We adopted a program that was headed off of a cliff for human space flight and have saved this program. We could not be prouder of it. The message is very clear that we care about human space flight. We will not only reduce the time when we won't be able to launch people to and from space from 
the United States, but we will accelerate the time when we are again exploring beyond low Earth orbit, going to new destinations, and rewriting those textbooks, revealing the unknown and reaching new heights. Uh, so thanks for the question. Thanks. Good morning, Lori. David Anderson, uh, retired Boeing, product development. Can you tell us a little bit about the competition and collaboration with other agencies, such as the European Space Agency or Japan's JAXA and others? Nearly half of NASA's programs are done in cooperation with uh, our international partners. The space station is the largest and most obvious example with 14 nations uh, working together collaboratively for these last 20 years. But our science programs are also almost never done alone, even in aeronautics, and certainly uh, in earth sciences where we share 100% of our data with the entire world, helping them manage their own resources uh, in their countries, helping them predict their weather, understand the changing planet. This is a global endeavor. NASA, I know we really believe that we can add to economic growth in this country by being more competitive, but where is a leader if there are no followers? So we, as a leader, believe in partnering with uh, the rest of the world. And it is a very, very gratifying thing to be at, a Na at NASA at a time when, while we symbolized the very Cold War in 1960s, we are a product of the space race, post-Sputnik, right? That's, that's why we're here. We are now working peacefully with Russia, the former Soviet Union, in order to expand human presence outward. And that, I don't think you can put a price tag on the value of offering that uh, to the world. And we hope to be able to continue to expand those partnerships uh, to provide leadership, but also partnership throughout uh, our future. We, when we went to the moon, turned around, looked back, and saw this one fragile planet. It is not a coincidence that Earth Day started in 1970, just one year after we landed on the moon. We went out, looked back, and it gave us a new perspective and a new appreciation for the planet that we reside on together. And I haven't talked to a single astronaut who hasn't come back changed, recognizing that we are all here together and more we can learn about not only how to help uh, live together peacefully, but how to uh, protect our planet. I think uh, that is one of the very, very best uh, investments that this nation can make. Thank you. Thanks. I was wondering how NASA is planning on inspiring the next generation of students. What inspires you? Uh, I really like the, the, the possibility of life on Mars and life on other planets. And okay, so what is NASA doing about that? We have, as I said, the Mars Science Laboratory on its way to Mars. We just announced through the Opportunity rover, which has spent the last three years roving Mars, again, uh, gypsum in uh, a, a river valley that is a very strong indicator of not just water on Mars, but flowing water on Mars. So what might that mean? Maybe we'll need Bill Nye to tell us. Where you find water, you find life. This is an extremely exciting thing, and we are exploring, as uh, we should, first with our robots and ultimately with humans. Your generation, I believe, will have the opportunity to go to space, to go back to the moon. I always thought I would get to go to the moon. I was eight years old when we first walked on it, and to go find out uh, what happened or where life on Mars is today. We are also through things like our discovery uh, just a couple weeks ago, although we've been working on it for a couple years, from uh, Kepler, a distant planet revolving around another star in the habitable zone. What will that mean? And when we launch the Webb telescope, we will be able to determine a surface and maybe find a blue planet in the habitable zone. Well, what will that mean, Bill Nye? These are the kinds of things that hopefully will inspire your generation. But people are inspired by a lot of things. I was inspired early on, of course, by NASA and our, our lunar explorations. But there are new things to learn, and uh, that, that I'm glad is something that you look for us to do, because again, that's a unique role 
of NASA. We feel we're the best in the world at it. We are pretty focused on it, and uh, we believe it returns real benefit because you then will hopefully study how to make those next discoveries. You'll go into fields that will help us uh, make those next innovations and continue uh, to explore and expand while returning real benefit to us here on Earth. So please do. Thank you. Yes, over here. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Jim Tillman, uh, research professor emeritus at University of Washington. Uh, many years ago, my staff and I operated Viking Lander 1 on Mars, did all of the spacecraft processing. We had some really good people there to do that. And I want to ask you about our future things. Uh, I'm a Finnish delegate to the International Mars Exploration Working Group. Understand NASA did not like the concept of a US citizen being a Finnish delegate, but that's the way it is. <laughs> and uh, we have a mission with Finland and Russia with small landers called MetNet, Meteorology Network. And uh, I want, would like your comments and want to encourage NASA to continue that kind of uh, collaboration. They're small landers, and, uh, but meteorology is very good. Do you have any, are you familiar with that mission, and do you have any comments? I'm not familiar with a particular mission. NASA is very interested. First of all, it sounds to me like U.S. leadership to have a, a U.S. Finnish representative for, for Mars exploration. We have the uh, experience at Mars of large and small landers, from Viking, thank you for your service uh, and contributions, uh, to the Spirit and Opportunity, to Pathfinder, uh, smaller rovers, which we are able to do more quickly and, and for less money. As I mentioned, the portfolio approach to technology, I think it's the same to exploration. We know there are certain things that have to be done through flagship missions and larger missions, but we also know that we can be more nimble, learning from uh, our, our knowledge that is gained in existing missions and create ways to go to distant places with smaller missions cheaper, especially while it costs so much to launch things, right? We know that uh, we can put those missions together more quickly. And I think as technology advances, one of the things we're looking to do is uh, have smaller instruments put those things uh, together where we can do even more in form of exploration. So, so thank you. I mean, from Viking, uh, to now has been an incredible, successful armada of spacecraft going to Mars, and uh, we stand on your shoulders, so thanks. Yeah, the the MetNet, uh, I wrote a paragraph that's in the book Towards Mars saying we need this kind of a small mission, okay. cheap mission. Uh, within three years, Russia had designed the breadboard and I showed it here at Come Together Washington, our $2 billion fundraiser. Uh, it's inexpensive, and our plans are to have 16 of them on the surface of Mars in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Very interesting. Maybe just one more, David, or you want me to? OK. Greg. Good morning, Laurie. Greg Marinak, St. Louis Science Center. Speaking of small and nimble, how is NASA working with these new, small, nimble, suborbital space companies in the United States to advance uh, both human and, and uh, scientific ventures? Well, that's a great question. So I did not mention our suborbital program. We have a program called Cruiser, and we are looking, again, since NASA has provided suborbital uh, transportation, as has the private sector for a while, for science, to having them be able to not only do more science cheaply, but Take that next payload. What, what might that next payload be? There's a lot of us around who would love to do an Alan Shepard, do a suborbital space flight. And so there are a couple of companies now looking at uh, that possibility, working toward uh, opening that market. And again, what would NASA do? We would buy research time on the suborbital market. Why would we launch our own suborbital rocket? if somebody's going uh, with uh, people on board, but we want to not only maybe send a researcher, but also uh, do the research that we're already doing uh, in that arena. So it is a very natural progression from suborbital to orbital, and a number of companies are working uh, toward achieving that market. Our role isn't to compete with them. 
it's to have them help us reduce the cost of the research that we would do anyway in that arena and maybe help establish their market and be an anchor tenant and buy down their risks. Completely appropriate role for NASA and we're, we're thrilled to be a part of it. And thank you all so, so much. Enjoy your day.